You're watching this video, so the chances are great that you enjoy what we create here at The Audrain. And if you do, why not take the next step and subscribe to this channel? You might also consider a membership in the Audrain Automobile Museum. We mount four new exhibitions each year featuring cars from the Audrain collections and loans from some of the leading collectors and institutions around the world. Click here to find out more. Donald, tell them what we're driving today. Today we are in a 1984 Ferrari 512 BBI. Uh, it's very funny because um, much like the uh, the name Daytona, right. which uh, Ferrari never gave the 365 GTC4, um, the BB is commonly referred to as Berlinetta Boxer, right. which is uh, Italian for a little coupe, and Boxer, of course, for a flat, um, horizontally opposed engine. However, right. of course, this is not an actual boxer engine. Right, it's a 180 right. degree V12, which is flat. Right. Um, but uh, because of the crankshaft design, the uh, pistons actually are moving in the same directions on opposite sides of the crankshaft. So, but better than a boxer, is just a name that sort of rolls off the tongue. Right, right. It's very evocative. You know, and it's interesting. This is sort of the last days of old school Ferrari. This is what they used to call in the old days, without being sexist, a man's car. Heavy controls, heavy clutch, fairly heavy um, gear shift, uh, fairly heavy steering. Um, it takes a bit of strength to park this or turn it, you know, so consequently I think it got that moniker that was considered Oh, that, it was a man's car. I mean, they don't use those terms anymore, but it just reminds me of that era. Plus, it has the classic Ferrari gate. Gated shifter, shifter. absolutely. A gated shifter. To me, that is the, the key to all Italian cars. I, I just <laughs> love it. it in the way it glides in automatically. You, you just push it, and it goes to, to the right and goes to the next corresponding gear. It's just such a entertaining machine to drive that although quite powerful it's five liter about what 350 horsepower exactly and in the mid 80s that was huge absolutely uh, that, that was uh, that was quite substantial yeah. power and it's it's funny that you mentioned that this is uh, you know you think of, of old Ferrari with this car uh, the interesting thing of course about the Berlin of the boxer is that it represented a revolutionary leap for Ferrari. That's true. This is their first Ferrari badged mid-engined car. Right, right. So this is the successor to the Daytona. And uh, so it was a very big deal that Ferrari was finally doing what every other uh, exotic car manufacturer was doing, taking the race-proven formula of mid-engined uh, position and using it in a street GT car. Well, Ferrari built, always built exciting, fast cars, but rarely innovative. I mean, they, yes. they, they let other people experiment, you know, like disc brakes came quite late to Ferrari. You know, I mean, when Jaguar beat them at Le Mans with uh, the disc brake cars, they're like, hmm, all right, maybe we need to, <laughs> to do something here about that, you know. But they've always been fairly conventional. Exactly, and uh, that's one of the things that uh, this car, it's always been one of my favorite Ferraris um, because I love the way it looks. It's got a really purposeful look. It's got that wonderful sound. There's nothing like the sound of that uh, flat 12. Uh, and it just sort of relates to everything that was happening in Formula One right. uh, at the time. And 
it's one of those shapes as well that I think just absolutely works. The uh, the Testarossa, which followed, you know, obviously improved in many ways on the uh, the BB, but uh, I think that overall, as sort of a timeless form, this really has it all over. The I would take this over a Testarossa. Yeah, that seemed more a poser's car to me. Yeah. Maybe it's the connection to Miami Vice and all yeah. that kind of nonsense. But this seems more like a driver's car to me. Exactly. And it has a certain sort of what I call a brutal elegance. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think it's, it's fair uh, to say. It's, uh, I think you have said that sort of the best or the most enduring designs are those designs that have the combination of the masculine and feminine. <laughs> right, and this, right. I think, is a great example of, of what you talk about with that. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there's nothing quite like a non-airbag steering wheel. <laughs> yes. I mean, I just don't like the firmness of it. I like it's just about the right size. Before they start to get too fat. Yeah, they, they, they're starting to put on a few pounds here. This is a little right. fatter than what I yeah. would normally like. But to me, I like that. Like when you drive like a 68 Rolls-Royce Corniche oh, with that, oh, very thin, thin wheel. wheel. Yeah, yeah, wonderful car, yeah. And very responsive. This was a hugely powerful car. I mean, there was nothing in America with more than 350 horsepower available in the 80s. If you think about it, I don't think there was anything. Corvette no, can... topped out at three. The Viper had not uh, been invented yet. Right. Uh, you know, so uh, this, was, this is what you got. And more than adequate. For sure. Now, one of the things, of course, is one of the great <laughs> catches of this period was that Actually, Ferrari did not sell this car new in the U.S. market. Um, they didn't want to go through all of the hassles of the emissions controls. Right, right. And so for a time, uh, this is, of course, the contemporary of the V8 uh, Ferrari that was introduced as the Dino, the 308 TT4. Right. And so for a time, the, the 308 TT4 was the only new Ferrari you could buy in the market, and they didn't bring in the V12s. So some were imported in time as gray market cars, and obviously now you can bring them in uh, whatever you like right. as collector cars. And uh, as you just as you just proved right then, this engine also disproves that notion that all Italian V12s are very peaky and, and you have to really run them high and hard. It's got really seamless power from yeah, you know, really 3,000 RPM all the way up. It's a wonderful driving car. It's it's the right size. Any bigger would be too big. Yes. It's just, and you know, there's plenty of room in the cabin here. I mean, I I have long legs. I'm not cramped in this. It's not like a mirror where you're sort of cramped in it. I mean, it's, it's also quite airy. Yeah. Especially for a mid-engine car. Yeah. The the vision in the back is not bad. The vision in the back is quite much better than the Countach. Yes. If you think about that, you know, compare this exactly to a 1984 Countach. Right. Uh, this is a much more hospitable place to be. You know, me and my long trips, you can actually take a long trip in this car. It yeah. does have room for some luggage. And uh, I think, as a matter of fact, they made a set of fitted luggage for this car, which I know is always one of your favorites. Yeah, that's you know, my you have, favorite. You have the, the handkerchief uh, suitcase yeah, and the stupid, sunglass suitcase. The stupid <laughs> fitted luggage. <laughs> you fold your shirts just to make the corner. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a car that you want to spend time in. Um, of course, one of the things that also, uh, this car also betrays certainly is the fact that it's a very handmade car. Yeah. I mean, you see all the hand stitching on the dashboard and uh, in the center console. And uh, of course, you know, a proper GT car of this era, the businessman expects air conditioning. Right. So it has air conditioning, but it's not going to freeze you out like an American air conditioning system. No, it won't even. I think you're being more than. It will cool your knees. This is a marvelous car. Boy, it's very nice to drive. Yeah. And when you think about the fact that. This is the progenitor, the, not the progenitor, but the, the, the first of a long line to follow of mid-engined uh, 12-cylinder Ferraris. Right. Um, that has only recently been reversed with uh, the introduction of the uh, front-engine V12s with the, uh, the 612 and, and those cars, uh, the 550. 
uh, which really is a return to the Ferrari of the 1950s and 60s. But uh, this is very much a car of the period and a car I which know. blends that sort of 1960s and 70s Ferrari essence with a new, a new trend, a new modernity. I really think something is lost with Ferrari not doing a manual car. I mean, Corvette and Porsche can do it, <clears throat> and Ferrari is legendary for this gated shifter and the whole deal. I, I can't believe every manual gearbox Ferrari that comes up for sale is more expensive than its equivalent automatic. And yet, they ne you'd think they'd make at least a limited run of a hundred or, or something. Ferrari's embarked on this new Icona series, right. uh, very limited production, high performance cars. And you know, I think to your point, I think it would be really interesting to have a manual gearbox car as one of the Icona series, because again, it sort of goes back to fundamentals, as it were. Um, I mean, sometimes you just enjoy driving. It's not all about top speed and top end. Correct. I mean, uh, one thing I'm glad that most manufacturers have oh, limited their top speed to you know 212 or 207 and fine that's fine yeah uh you know like i, I drove the mclaren speed tail and that runs out to 252. well they know where you're going to do that you're going to go to prison you'll be in jail you lose your license for life i mean to me as i've said a million times all the fun is between 40 and 120. and that's where this car excels it's so much fun to just play with this gear shift it's exactly. such a positive engagement you it clicks it. You feel like you're involved in the car. You feel like you're driving. I don't feel the need to turn on the radio or listen to a podcast because I'm enjoying the sound of the motor. I'm enjoying the gearbox. Can an automatic shift faster? Yeah, okay. Yes, exactly. That, that's the point. Sometimes it's not just about the ultimate in technology and the ultimate yeah. in speed. It's about what happens on your journey. And I think that that's uh, what this car epitomizes. And you will see. And so much about a car is how it makes you feel. Yeah. And this, you really feel like you're involved in it. It's really just so much fun. You want to spend all afternoon in this. Thing. I wish we had a lot more time in this car. In fact, I'd like to borrow it for the weekend. It's it's just something. Taking this up in the hills, you don't feel like you're using the whole road. You don't feel like you're always crossing the double line. I mean, around here we never get it out of second, third gear hardly ever. Exactly. This I'm is the car for, for open spaces, big sweepers. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what tenuous connection you picked out for houses. Well, the house we're going to see today is something which we've not seen before on Manchester Motor Cars. Yes. It's a contemporary house, but much like Ferrari taking the step from its traditional form of front-engine GT cars right. into the world of the mid-engine car, right. but still keeping some of the cues that have been traditional to Ferrari, the house we're going to see takes a very interesting, makes a very interesting take yes. on the traditional New England architecture with a different twist. Well, that, be very interesting to see. That's the most tenuous connection so far. <laughs> so I'm curious to see how a house compares to this Ferrari. But uh, all right, all right. I, I, You'll I, see. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I'm willing to learn. Meanwhile, <laughs> I'm going to continue driving this until we have to go to the house. <laughs> You'll enjoy the house, Jay, I guarantee you. Well, I'm sure I will. In fact, I'm going to put my foot in and make sure we get there a little quicker. Jay, here we are at our home today, Sunset Terrace. Donald, I, frankly, I'm a bit stunned. Normally, we're dealing with 100-year-old homes, 80-year-old homes. This is the first, well, this is like a brand new house, is it? The house was completed in 2016, so right. yes, it is very much a contemporary home, but much like this Ferrari 512BB, showing the transition from the traditional front-engine GT architecture that Ferrari had been using mm -hmm. to this mid-engine, a more modern approach, this house takes a traditional approach to All New right. England architecture. Yes. The shingle architecture here, some of the details that you see in this house are typically found in the same 100 and 120 year old houses that are right. here in New England and in Newport. 
Okay, I want to be clear, it doesn't look anything like a Ferrari. <laughs> well, there are a few things. No, it is a house which is quite interesting because if you look at all the details here, right. even the, uh, the shingle eyebrow over the second floor window, which is a very typical detail right. for a shingle house, but it also reveals a different style. It does look like a house that had been here. It looks like something that was built maybe the 40s, 50s, or 60s, although the chimney, the, the brick in the chimney work gives it away. But it's all modern inside is what you're saying. Well, it's modern inside, but it also pays homage to the traditional New England uh, uh, local building traditions while also infusing a very Asian and open and calm influence. So oh, it's, right. it's, it's one of those things that has dual character, sort of, uh, you know, like a, a mullet haircut that you would have uh, worn in, in your day. I never wore a mullet haircut, but that, that's okay. You know, it's just uh, one of those things that, like a mullet, it's business in the front and party in the rear. You know? I've never partied in the rear. I want to make that clear <laughs> right now. But let's, let's go in let's and look, look at, at the, the house. house. Yeah, let's look at the house. No partying in the rear. Well, this is very nice. So Jay, as I said, this is a home that reveals another side of it once you're inside. The traditional New England shingle home is now an open Asian inspired space. And it's very interesting because there are a lot of things, the owners who are very well traveled and enjoy traveling in Asia uh, and also in Europe, uh, like to have wonderful details. It's all about details in the house. The, all the lighting fixtures were custom made in Italy and ordered by the, uh, the wife of the couple. The uh, couple are both Buddhists. Right. And so the idea of calm and space and light is very important. And yet within this framework of a traditional New England uh, home. Well, I like all of this. I I know nothing about art, but I think I like what's attractive. And if I'm attracted to it, then it must be good because I know nothing about it. <laughs> no, but you know what I'm saying? I oh, mean, it, it doesn't, I don't walk in and go like this. I mean, I like the, the, the theme of the flowers throughout the house. And I see what you mean about the custom uh, fixtures and everything. Yeah, very nice. Nature is very important inside and outside this home. And we'll see that uh, right, as we right. walk through and look at some of the gardens. Let's take a look at the dining room. It's a very okay. interesting feature. So again, you have here something which is totally contemporary and yet still pays such amazing attention to the kind of detail you would find in some of the older houses, the wainscoting, yeah. with the raised paneling, which is very typical of what we find in a lot of the yeah, houses of the 1890s and 1900s. Yeah, this wood, the floor is beautiful, all of this, this is very nice. And, and also even the step back uh, ceiling. And it's you know, all that true. And it is a, it's a separate room, but it's not. You know, I mean, you have a barrier here, which kind of, yeah. It's, it's, it, it separates the spaces in a way which is very typical of a traditional home, but interprets it in another way. Yeah, yeah. And then in the main living space as well, you see how it's very high that uh, you commented outside on right. the uh, stone of the fireplace, which is this slate instead of the brick that you typically find in right, a home here. Right, right, right. So again, just a slightly contemporary twist on what is the traditional, but still, things like the wood it gives you also a very nautical feel right, here right. on the water. Yeah, no, so you, you feel yeah. that the, the, the butterfly sculpture, which is an amazing thing made by a contemporary artist of recycled aluminum cans. And there, there's all sorts of features of living with nature here in this home. Yeah, very nicely done. Yeah, it's beautiful. So here's a very special place oh, in very this nice. home. A dedicated cigar room. Yes, a man of business, men of science, men of commerce will meet and, and close deals. Let's make a deal. Let, let's shake on it. I say, Wadworth, uh, there we are. Again, the level of detail that's found in this home, in the build, the inlaid uh, border on the floor of now, the marquetry. Now, I'm looking at this. Now, is this an old floor taken from an old home and put in here, or is it totally new? Totally new. Amazing millwork. The owners work very closely with Glenn Parker and Parker Construction on the bill to get all these details just right. Another thing which is great, take a look at the fireplace. The hearth, that incredibly beautiful piece of figured marble. Yeah. Which is I, absolutely remarkable. You know, you, th you forget there are people who can still do this kind of work because they're so used to just 
taking old things and not knowing how they did it in the first place, but putting it into a modern setting. I mean, that's really incredible. I can't imagine how much work and effort that must cost to do, because back in the day it was expensive, and Absolutely. now you're doing it now and you gotta pay the guys welfare and <laughs> you know, pay, pay, you know, pay his insurance, pay. It, it must be very expensive too. It's a very diff different thing to, to do than when the Gilded Age homes were built. But again, I, I just draw your attention to even things like the, the door handles, they're, they're bronze. So right. they age and weather in the same way that the 100-year-old homes do. Right. It, it is a, an idea of, of paying attention to the setting in which the house sits that really makes a difference. And plus they have what all modern fil filtration in here, so it gets the stale cigar smoke, just goes out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The uh, advance of the technology here as opposed to a smoking room in a Gilded Age mansion, which you can imagine what that was like. They had to replace the paintings every 40 years because right. you couldn't see them anymore. Right, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very different thing. Yeah. So nice um, the last part of, of, of this property that I'd like to show you personally is, again, something which relates directly to the owner's feeling of serenity and peace. Wonderful meditation gardens here. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. So one of the great advantages, of course, of living by the water in a place like Newport is the fact that it's a place of relative calm, like at your house, hearing the, the, the sound of the water breaking. But to have here in Newport, near the water, this wonderful meditation garden is also very important to the owners. And I think a beautiful example of how this site has been maximized mm. to really provide a really special experience. Hey, you birds, shut the hell up! <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. You're Nature. Meditating. Something which is very, very important to Jay Leno, we can tell. Well, I'm ready to meditate to the ohm sound of a six cylinder Jaguar. Should we give it a try? Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Well, Jay, just as we've seen at Sunset Terrace, the traditional combined with the modern, I think that uh, with this 1952 Jaguar XK120M fixed head coupe, we see the form and design of a 1930s streamlined coach-built French car with the most modern of power plants, right. the legendary XK. Uh -huh six-cylinder engine. I think this is one of the most beautiful sports cars of all time. I'm surprised they don't go for a lot more. If they'd only built 15 of these, yeah. oh, they'd be two for three million dollars. But because they built so many, thankfully, a lot of people get to enjoy it. And growing up in New England, this is always my favorite because it was cozy. You could drive in the winter, it'd be freezing and snow and rain. Oh, you'd be in this cozy little library with this beautiful wood panel dash, and the leather seats and the smell, the aroma of the leather. And you had a, a, a pretty good heater too on these things. It was just a, a wonderful experience. As much as I like the open car, the closed cars were always the prettiest. Jaguar is one of the few companies that can make a closed car that's prettier than the convertible. Absolutely, you know, I agree 100%. Oh, the XK with that door that opened, ah! A fantastic door in the center there, and, and this thing. I mean, it's a little cramped. It's a little tight in here for, uh, I think, nowadays average size Americans, but especially in the passenger seat, it's fine. Yeah, it is a, um, you know, it is a cozy space, and the, it has a very English feel because, English like to save space, right? You know, and uh, where they could maximize the use of space. I mean, obviously, the the ultimate example is what Alec Isagonis did with the Mini, right? Right. right. You know, uh, but unlike uh, a 1952, typically a 1952 American car, there is not a lot of extra space. You have the space you need for the engine, space to fit two people, a trunk to fit their luggage, and right. that's it. And we're looking at. 3.4 liter, correct? 3.4 liter, yeah. Yep. Twin cam, very advanced for the day. 
twin carb. Yeah, standard horsepower was 160, and the M it was 180. I've got one of these in blue, an M coupe, and it's even people who don't care or know nothing about cars comment about what a beautiful car this is. It's such a timeless look, and Jaguars have a strong appeal to women. Women who I know who know nothing about cars love Jaguars. They just like the way they look. Because again, this is the classic example of that male, female. It's got both sides to it. It's got a feminine side and it's got a male side. And, and it's, it's uh, yeah, you really know, not, not uh, coincidental that, uh, you know, quite famously, Jaguars were designed by William Lyons, who owned right. the company, who was not a designer or a stylist. Right. But he knew what he liked and he right. could express that to his designers. And the cars all had a very, very strong look, as you said. The, the lines are very soft and flowing, but much like the namesake, it's got those very powerful haunches. So, you know, yeah. so this is a powerful car, you know? This is a car designed to drive. And it's one of the few cars in the period you can drive on modern highways and cruise at 75 or 80 miles an hour all day long. I mean, it's just just a wonderful driving machine. It was so advanced in its day. <laughs> it was just about the fastest sports car you could get, I think, in the early 50s. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, uh, that Roadster set the uh, land speed record for a production car right. in Belgium. And, you know, it was a, uh, a thing that a lot of manufacturers sort of claimed uh, speed records. And, of course, that car was slightly modified. Right. It wasn't exactly a car off the production line. But nonetheless, it was close enough in spec that you've right. got actual performance out of these cars. Um, in a way that must have been astonishing in 1948, oh, 1950. Yeah, yeah. To have a car with this kind of power, this kind of road holding as well. Yeah, well, we talked about this in other videos. In 1952, the three fastest vehicles in the world were all British. The fastest motorcycle, the Mr. Black Shadow, the fastest car, the XK120M, and the fastest saloon or family car, the Bentley Continental. And they really ruled the road. It was pretty amazing. And it's always great to have, again, I bring it back to my tenuous connection with Sunset Terrace, but to have sort of the best of both worlds. This is like being, as you said, in a cozy English club. Right. But you're driving a very capable, uh, high-performance car. Right, right. You know, you're not giving up anything in terms of comfort uh, for it. Uh, the, the racing versions of these cars, of course, are a very, very different story. Um, I also like the way uh, Jaguar gave the coupes and the fixed head, uh, sorry, the fixed head coupe and the convertible, the drop head, uh, a very different character from the open two seater. Right, right. That, you know, didn't have all the wood, had a uh, Rexine covered dashboard and you know, no windows and all of that, you know, very yeah. much sort of the, the wind in your face sports car. And Jaguar was really the hero of, of English industry. You know, the, the thing in those days was export or die. Yes. If you didn't sell your products overseas and bring money into England, you weren't doing your part. And they sold like hotcakes, these things. These plus soon to come Austin Healey and Aston Martin. But Jaguar was really top of the hill. Americans seem fascinated. Clark Gable bought one of these, which just made everybody go crazy. You know, he, that was the first days of sort of a celebrity provenance with a car and all that kind of stuff. So it, it was an exciting time. And yes, as you said, Americans really took the Jaguar. And I think that uh, Jaguar also had something which very few manufacturers have ever been able to do successfully and consistently, which is to combine performance and comfort. Right. That's a really uniquely Jaguar feature. Yeah. You know, you don't feel that in, uh, you know, a Ferrari or so a Maserati of, of this period. Um, certainly in 1952, Ferraris were very primitive cars. You know, the road-going cars had beautiful Italian bodies, right. but they were very noisy. They rode hard. And you know they didn't have this kind of control for the road that that you want in a passenger car. And as you said, it feels it it, it feels like a modern car. The chassis is very responsive. 
it's uh you know it's uh there's a good reason why these have been such popular collector cars uh, I don't think it ever fell out of fashion, you know? Um, it's, it's funny, you know, every decade has, well, it's never going to get better than this. Right. In the first decade, it was the 1913 Mercer Racerville. That was a car, easy to start, it was fast, it won races, and they really thought, well, you're not going to progress much beyond this. I mean, <laughs> it goes almost 100 miles an hour, you got, and I could see in the 50s how you would think if you own one of these. Incredibly fast, powerful, reliable. It's never going to get better than this, you know? Exactly. It's just funny. How can it? <laughs> and also, coming out of, you know, putting this into context as well, historical context is so interesting and so important. World War II was not that long before this car was built. Right. And when you think about the devastation that the UK suffered during World War II, the fact that they could produce this product and, and ship it around the world was also a remarkable thing and something that gave hope to a lot of people who just a few years before, you know, they had no idea what was going to come tomorrow. Well, there's a book I know you probably heard of called Flywheel. You know that yes. book, right? It's a wonderful book. You know, the Germans thought they would be allies with the English. So the German, uh, the, uh, the English prisoners were never cre treated as horribly as the Jews and other people that weren't right. executed. They, and they allowed uh, British prisoners to have pencils and paper. And there was a group of guys in the prison camp that were engineers and car guys, and they all sketched the car they wanted to have when they got out of, when the war was over and they finally got home. And all the money goes to uh, one of the British charities for veterans and stuff. But it's a fascinating book to see what people were thinking of at the time, and Jaguar played a big part. In fact, Jaguar changed its name. It used to be SS. SS, exactly. Then the nefarious connotation with the Nazis, of course, they had to get rid of that. And that stood for Swallow, Swallow Sidecar. Sidecar. Yeah, yeah. What, one of the best examples of British understatement is an early Jaguar ad when they talk about the new name of the company and they said that you know we were, we, we were known as Swallow Sidecar uh, before the war but since uh, that name came to have unfortunate connotation right. we changed the name and thought wow that's really sort of being very subtle about it yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it is a uh, what I also love about being in this car in this moment is the fact that you know as you know, I am a habitué of bow ties. Right. And no matter what you may think about uh, that, you have to say, and I'll get you to say this. Uh, what is that? I am perfectly dressed for this vehicle. Would well, you not agree? Uh, yeah, since I have to say it, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would say that's probably true. Well, the you car know, inspires you. Uh, the thing I loved about it was, I loved those days when people raced for the honor of their country. New Valari with the Italians, uh, not so much the Germans with uh, the auto union and stuff, but there were, there, there were a lot of drivers that didn't subscribe to the Nazi. Uh, you know, Ross Meyer and a few of those other guys, they, they were race car drivers. They, they, they were not Nazis, you know. But, you know, I, but my favorite was always Sterling Moss, you know. He drove for king and country, whether right. whether the English cars were competitive or not, he still stuck with them. And I think I always liked that, and that, that, that sort of spirit of, you know. The I, Bulldog I, Drummond kind of. A, yeah, I used to love the, during the war, they updated Sherlock Holmes to the Nazis, to World War II. And there's one great one where uh, uh, Basil Rathbone, he's down on the docks in disguise. You know, trying to find out what longshoremen are sneaking German goods into Italy, you know. And he gets discovered. And, uh, and the Armstrong take taking down the bar and they're beating the crap out of him, you know. And he gives his <laughs> big speech. Go, oh, you men, you're the scum of the earth. You're the worst that we ever made. But you're Englishmen first. Yeah, come on! And they all rally, you know, and they go out and they kill the Nazis. And, I mean, it, it, it's, it's one of those soul-stirring things, you know. It just, it just makes me admire the Jaguar and the English people more. Exactly. Them. You know, you are inspired. You, you do feel a little closer 
to the spirit of the people that built this car and, and yeah. why. It, it's absolutely wonderful. We both are big fans of Jaguar and especially of this period. And uh, again, I just love this whole idea of what this car represents in terms of looking back and surging forward. This is just absolutely amazing. I love it. Now, our next car we're going to drive is another example of something of this type, but the ultimate expression. So, yeah, I'm anxious to try this. Yeah, it's a great car. Now, Jay, we'll see a thoroughly contemporary version of Transition. Yeah. This is my kind of transition. The car we're driving right now, a 2023 Porsche Cayman GT4, RS, I think it's fair to say, right? Six cylinder, about what? 500 horsepower, 490, something like that? 500 horsepower, four liter, yeah. six. Now this differs from a 911, and this is a true mid-engine design, correct? This is a mid-engine design, and to me, this is the absolute epitome of the Cayman. It's what the Cayman always should have been. Right. But. You know, I think Porsche was very careful for a very long time to make sure that the spec of the Cayman always stayed below that of the 911. Right, Because right. they didn't want to compete with themselves. Um, but again, for me, thinking about what Porsche is, is built on, their reputation, the, the, the most legendary Porsche race cars uh, from the 1950s were all mid-engine cars, the right. RS, RSK. And when they came out with this platform, the Boxster, and the uh, Cayman. I thought, wow, this is fantastic. It's a smaller car than the 911. Sort of, it feels like what the 911 was when it first came out in right. the 1960s. And with this version, it has all the power that this car has always deserved. And people far more knowledgeable than I think to think it handles better than the 911. Is that fair to say? I guess that might be sacrilege in the Porsche world. But I think it's absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of work that's done in terms of development of the 911 has been to make the car handle and perform the way it should, given the immense power that the fastest 911s have now. You know, it's they have the twin turbos yeah. and all-wheel drive. You have to have that in order to exploit that power. It's probably fair to say, to the average buyer, this would be a better handling car than a 911. True 911 pilots know how to make that car do amazing things. And they have done amazing things. Well, there you go. I mean, this car is absolutely amazing. I mean, it delivers levels of performance that, yeah. you know, a 911 GT2 did uh, not a few years ago. Yeah, I, and you know, they all have the feel that they're solid billet, you know? It, it, the level of workmanship, you know, the old saying, they don't build them like they used to, thank God for that, <laughs> because this, just feels like the whole thing is just carved from one solid piece of titanium. It's amazing. There's no flex of any kind. If you choose, you can feel every bump. You can run over a dime and know whether it's head or tails. You know, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. I mean, you have levels of yeah. performance that just. And you know, I have to say this yeah. because a lot of people are totally crazy about the amazing accelerative properties of electric cars. And right. it's true, right. nothing beats those. Right. But to have the combination of that kind of acceleration with that sound coming with it, yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that's just magic. Yeah, Absolute it really magic. is. You know, just proving that, I drove one of those Demon 170s mm -hmm. with 125, 1,025 horsepower, which is the same as the Tesla. Right. And, but it feels so much faster because the wheels are off the ground and they're making all sorts of noises. It's hilarious. Stuff is happening. I mean, you have a 9,000 RPM red line on this thing, which is... And the car feels eager, you know? Yeah, it, 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 it does. It's, uh, 
not one of those things that uh, I believe this also has that uh, that gauge function that uh, Porsche has now to map the performance see where you are in the power range how much you're using and how efficiently it's using it and this is a car again I keep coming back to it over and over again that not only is great to rev but yeah. it also gives power from really low down plus it's so much better than you are yes that you you never get tired of it the average person will never be able to find the limits of this thing Well, nothing sounds like that, does it? Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's something. It, it, it's amazing. And again, to have the mid-engine the configuration, it's right there behind your ears. Right, you right. Know? And there's no piece of glass between it either. No. It's, uh, and you also think about the fact that uh, when the Boxster was first introduced, it was one of the first cars where you could not see the engine at all. You had I remember going to the battle. auto show yeah. and being mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. I want to see the engine. I want to be able to touch it. I, want, I mean, I, I was just thought that was the dumbest thing ever. You know, I mean, it, it just, it's, it's funny how that works. Yeah, and this car is on display. Yeah. yeah as, as it should be. It's, it's, a, it's a priceless jewel. Um, and, uh, you know, my only small capital of the car is the fact that, you know, I love the design of this car. I think it's absolutely beautiful. And I understand that the rear wing is there for a purpose for downforce at maximum speed on a track in this car. Right. And this is designed to be a track day car. Right. Um, I just wish that Porsche had a touring version of this without the wing. Right, um, right. Because again, for most of the driving that's going to happen, we don't need that extra bit of downforce. Right. But, uh, you know, as wings go, it's also nicely integrated. It's not this sort of thing that looks like uh, somebody uh, stole something from uh, an, an airplane hangar and just tacked on the and back of the car. this is normally aspirated? This is normally aspirated. Right, okay. It certainly feels like it. I mean, this PDK transmission has come so far. I remember when they first came out, they are a little clunky. Um, now it's just, um, it's like a scalpel. Exactly, and you know, we, we talk about the manual gearbox thing, and you know, this is really fast and very capable, very responsive. Um, you know, what people often don't realize is not actually not, of course, an automatic transmission. It's a manual transmission which is controlled electronically. Right, right. You know, when I read about these multi-million dollar supercars being produced, I wonder, how can they be that much better than this? No. I mean, this would keep me fully entertained for a long, long time. Uh, I, it, it, it just seems to do everything. Yeah, it, it uh, gets into that whole discussion about the numbers game. I mean, without a doubt, 500 is a lot of horsepower right. um, and, by, by any measure. But, you know, what's the difference between driving this car with 500 and driving another car with 1,000? And it's interesting because to the average person, even to the average automobile enthusiast, oh, this is a 911. Right. You know, it looks like a 911. Uh, so, so you get that cachet, even though it's a Cayman. Yeah, which, you, you don't have to apologize for having right. the lesser Porsche. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ugh. <laughs> just do this all day long. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, I'm just going to drive to jail. I'm just going to drive to jail. You know, there's got to be a great route to jail on this road and then connected with uh, Mulholland Drive right. and uh, the Highway 1. And the nice uh, thing is the steering is so nice, even at slow speeds, you find yourself really enjoying each turn. And doesn't it feel light and very connected? It feels very light and very... You know, it's, I'm sure this is... I mean, it's a light car compared to modern sports. This is probably, what, 34, 3500, yes. something like that. Uh, but it feels like... A 1500 pound car. I mean, it's amazing. So, Jay, thinking about tradition, as we've seen at Sunset Terrace, reinterpreted with other themes of other cultures and in a way that is so incredibly true and appropriate, 
Can you not see the ultimate expression of my tenuous connection here in this Cayman I'm GT4? I'm not even paying attention to what you're saying. <laughs> I'll see what this does. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah! That's Jay's way of saying, yeah, yeah Donald, you're right. I'm sorry, Donald, you said something. <laughs>